filling the gaps in space exploration from the Gold Coast of Australia. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Adam Gilmore, CEO and founder of Gilmore Space Technologies. Welcome, Adam. Hi, nice to meet you. What is your mission at Gilmore Space Technologies, and what motivated you to found the company? Well, our long-term mission is we want to help humanity get up into space and stay there. Our short-term mission is we want to take small satellites up into low Earth orbit, which we think is a fabulous business opportunity for the next five or 10 years. And it'll give us the money um, to continue developing space technology. Uh, if you look at our logo, we have a spaceship going from the Earth to the moon, then to Mars and then to the stars. And that's pretty much the long-term vision of the company. Um, I started the company because I've always been a space fan. Um, I guess I was annoyed with the pace of space technology development. And I thought uh, after a career in banking, I had enough money to kind of do something about it. I did a lot of research on the industry and figured out where the gaps were. And it seemed like there were a lot of fantastic companies building fantastic satellites with great new technology, but there just wasn't enough access to space. And I thought if I want to develop technology for space, if I can take it up on my own rocket, that's the best way to go. So that's why I started a rocket company. Tell us about your One Vision rocket and how it addresses a gap. Okay, so the One Vision is a technology demonstrator. Um, one of the things that we think is important when you're running a company that's backed by investors is to demonstrate uh, milestones in technology. So we thought very early on the piece that if we tested a rocket engine that would be our main rocket engine, which we were doing last year very successfully, if we put it onto a rocket and did a flight test, that's a further verification of the technology because when you put it in a rocket and send it towards space, it accelerates at four or five, six Gs. It goes, you know, supersonic. So you get a whole lot of the same flight conditions that you would on a normal launch rocket into space. So that's why we're doing this test is to demonstrate not just the rocket engine, but a whole lot of the other systems on the rocket as well that we'll hopefully carry over into the orbital vehicle. What are some of the benefits and challenges of launching rockets from Australia? I think one of the benefits is that it depends on your location, but Australia has an eastern seaboard with at least a thousand miles of open sea, um, you know, towards the east. So you can launch from locations in Australia to lots of different inclinations and you don't have to worry about flying over Cuba or any of the Caribbeans if you're launching from Kennedy. And, you know, most launch locations in the world have certain restrictions on them, but in, you know, from Queensland, you can pretty much fly anywhere you want. Um, the challenges, I guess, is the country hasn't got a very well-established space industry. Um, the government has only very recently just started a space agency. Uh, there is not a lot of funding uh, for space companies at the moment, but it's beginning to drip in now. So we're, we're positive, but it's a lot harder to start one here than the U.S. How many ways are there to boost a payload into orbit? And how do you differentiate yourself from the likes of SpaceX, United Launch Alliance, Blue Origin, and National Space Agencies? Well, yeah, there's a lot of different ways. We're going for a different market. So SpaceX, ULA, Blue Origin, they're all building massive rockets, you know, that can take literally buses to space. But the market that we're going for takes satellites about the size of a microwave oven or a small fridge. So that's very difficult for the big rockets to take those small satellites up in ones and twos. It's not economical. It's like, you know, a, a 737 taking three passengers to Los Angeles from New York. It doesn't make any sense. So you need a smaller vehicle that can take smaller satellites directly where they want to go. And that's what our customers want. They want to get a ride to space at a time that suits them to a place that suits them and a price that's as cheap as possible. And that's what we're trying to do. How much can a privately funded rocket maker rely on off the shelf technologies and components? And how much do you have to invent from scratch? Uh, well, we, um, we make a lot of the stuff ourselves. 
from components. I mean, there's been fantastic leaps in technology in terms of, you know, CNCs, 3D printers, um, all of these things are fantastic to prototype uh, rocket components. Um, you know, we use composite uh, products as well. So we've got a slew of materials that we can use, you know, all the metals and, you know, many of the composites and lots of 3D printers. Um, and then for stuff like the avionics, we are looking at buying that from uh, off the shelf. Uh, from, you know, a lot of other manufacturers make things like flight computers and uh, navigation units and GPS systems. Um, so, you know, a bit like a car, you know, we make as much as we can, but we buy stuff if it's more economical to buy it from somewhere else. Tell us about your collaboration with NASA. Okay, so the NASA uh, Space Act Agreement, that is an agreement that allows us to collaborate with NASA where we pay NASA for its services if we collaborate with them. So my brother and I did a road show to a few NASA centers about two and a half years ago and talked about all the technology we were working on and showed some prototypes. So one of the prototypes we had was a, a rover that used a microwave oven to mine water on either Mars or the moon. And it was, it was actually a paper that was written by some NASA scientists in the 80s, but they never made a prototype. We investigated, thought it looked good, made a prototype, um, and then showed them the prototype. And they said, look, this is fantastic. We'd like to continue working with you on this, bring it over to the States and, and test it at one of our facilities. So that's kind of the genesis of the Space Act Agreement. How do you see the market for private space, by space launch services evolving? Um, very strongly. Um, we think what's going to happen is the constellations are going to go up, the broadband ones. So SpaceX, Starlink, the OneWeb, um, Telesat, uh, Amazon's talking about putting a constellation up now. And the good thing about these constellations is they go up in the low Earth orbit, which is where our rockets can go, and they only have limited lifespans, five to seven years. So you can think if you put 7,000 satellites up, and they have a lifespan of seven years, then a thousand of them have to be replaced on average every year. And they're all put into lots of different orbits. So it's not like you, know, you see SpaceX taking up 60 Starlink satellites at once, they're putting them all in one orbital plane, but they're not all gonna die at the same time. So if they die in ones and twos, they're gonna need replacements in ones and twos. And that's what I was talking about before. It doesn't make sense to take one or two satellites up on a Falcon 9, makes a lot more sense to put it on ours. Well, there you have it. Adam Gilmore, CEO and founder, Gilmore Space Technologies. It's exciting industry to be in right now, and it's exciting for all of us. If somebody wants to connect with you, maybe they want to find out more about the work that you're doing. How can they do that? Our best place is on our website, um, www.gspacetech.com. And there's a click, there's a button on there you can click and write an email, and that comes directly to me. And, and some of the other senior people in the company. And we read every email we get. There you go. And if you guys wanna find more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.